Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the ITU AI and Machine in 5G Challenge webinar series. Thank you very much for sparing your valuable time and to join this session today. My name is Thomas Baskoro from the ITU, and it is my privilege to introduce today's webinar. The ITU AI and Machine in 5G Challenge is organized by uh, ITU, which is United Nations Agency for ICTs. The mandate of the ITU is to allocate frequencies to services that use the radio spectrum, to develop standards, and to assist developing countries in setting up their ICT infrastructure. This challenge is kindly sponsored by Xilinx and Ministry of Science and ICT Korea. We would like to thank uh, the two sponsors uh, for the sponsorship. The aim of the challenge is to create a community that will solve network related problems using AI and machine learning. Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Uh, today's session is, the speaker for today's session is Tim O'Shea. Tim is a co-founder and CTO at DeepSig, which is a venture-backed startup that is building unique AI and machine learning driven baseband technology, and also pioneering the route to the AI native 6G run making 4G MIMO and 5G massive MIMO VRAN uh, system. These are performant as well as autonomous. Tim also serves as a research assistant professor at Virginia Tech in Arlington, Virginia, and previously worked with USG Lab on applied software and cognitive radio R&D. He is the co-chair of IEEE Imaging Technology Area on Machine Learning for Communications an editor for transactional wireless communication, as well as transaction cognitive communication and networking. He's organizer of IEEE Spoke, IEEE Infocom, IEEE Globcom, IEEE ICC MLC workshops, as well as GNU radio conference. He has authored over 50 peer reviewed uh, works and more than 500 citations, over 40 patents on machine learning and wireless communications. He previously worked with uh, Hokwai 360, Federated Wireless, Cisco Systems, and Stochastic Research. He, he has also served on technical advisor boards of uh, NSF, DAPA, EU Horizon 2020, and other USG programs. So at this point, I would like to welcome Tim. Um, but of course, before I give him the floor, I would like to just go through briefly on, on the talk today. So in today's talk, he will cover some key data-driven AI and machine learning software solutions, which will make 4 or 5G VLAN infrastructure more performant. He will also highlight on how powerful AI or machine learning-based spectrum sensing and broad sensing making capabilities are becoming an enabler for spectral efficiency, interference-free operations, and security within public and private RAN deployments. He will also highlight some of the works that they are working on in these areas. And also the, he will share about the data-driven wideband spectrum activity recognition challenge, uh, open data competition. So this competition uh, helps to provide a new broad definition and sp uh, scoring metrics for spectrum activity sensing uh, for different uh, scenarios. So welcome team and it's exciting to have you. Yeah, so thank you. So I guess, so what I was going to really talk about is, um, you know, AI and machine learning is, is transforming many, many things in the world right now. Um, you know, being able to leverage more data more quickly and more dynamically in all kinds of applications. Um, we really focus in on baseband processing. So this is kind of like the layer one, um, the kind of the core of wireless communication systems that, that make them work and allow them to communicate. Um, and so um, I'm going to really dive into how using AI and ML in kind of new ways within baseband processing um, and within sensing systems um, can really help improve 4G and 5G systems today and, and how this, this is continuing to become part of kind of the vision for the longer term beyond 5G um, world. So like to, to go into that, I like to start with what is the need? Um, and so what are, what are the drivers uh, it, it, out there? Um, and so um, this was a, a poll 
that, that um, GSMA conducted and, and shared at, at Mobile World Congress this year. Uh, and this really looks at, you know, what do operators and deployers of, of our cellular systems want? Um, and, you know, if you, if you look at this, um, you know, this is really all about a lot of fundamental communications um, aspects. So looking at peak data rates, uh, network capacity, user density, um, reduction of cost, you know, openness and interoperability of these systems, improvements in coverage and improvements in latency. You know, these are all major needs that, that operators want in their networks and that we all need to have in, in our networks to help reduce the cost of wireless communications, uh, make it work better for us and allow it to be used for all kinds of new applications to help drive all of the verticals and the, the app ecosystems. Um, so I think where we've been with 5G, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about what are the big apps and the, the killer verticals and apps that are gonna drive cellular networks in the future. Um, and really my hope is that, you know, we're really now looking back to some degree at, at the fundamentals of, a, of wireless communications. You know, these are the, the actual air interface performance metrics and needs that, that, that um, can drive better wireless systems that can make them cheaper and more affordable, more accessible and more applicable for many applications. Um, so you can really kind of group these into two sets. So we have, um, you know, the ones that, that are really focused on RAN and network capacity. And I think a lot of this comes down to, you know, we need better air interface efficiency in our wireless systems. Um, and we can get there through looking at modulation schemes, multi-user strategies, um, how we reuse the spectrum uh, spatially between different users, um, and really just using the spectrum better and more effectively. Uh, and then it also comes down to RAN efficiency and openness. So if we wanna drive down the cost of these systems, um, you know, we need to have uh, more componentized uh, market-driven um, systems for, for wireless components. Um, we need to leverage hardware that's already going into volume and scale. So things like um, tensor cores and tensor operations and instructions on, on commodity scaled hardware and equipment. Uh, and, and much of this being built to run fast AI algorithms today. Um, and so we then need to embrace kind of virtualization and software to help uh, deploy this more quickly and easily uh, maintain and, 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 and make management cheaper and easier. Um, and then ultimately energy efficiency. So, you know, we can't be consuming more and more power. Um, you know, we need to be able to shrink the processing solutions and the radio solutions so that we can accomplish this all, you know, with a lower power uh, footprint um, and, and smaller and less invasive in our, in our world. Um, and so I think, you know, the really two core technologies that I think get at almost all of these issues um, that I'm gonna kind of really dive into here are this um, idea of this AI native air interface um, which means that, you know, AI is used to design and optimize and continually improve the way we are transmitting data over the air in our wireless systems. Uh, and then AI sensing and communications, which means that, um, you know, we're using AI to make sense out of the wireless environment uh, and, and monitor and understand what's going on in the spectrum in real time so that we can continually improve our communication systems uh, and how they use resources and how they access the spectrum so that we can make the most out of all of the, the, the finite RF spectrum that we have uh, to really maximize all these performance metrics for users of a wireless system. Um, so this is the motivation, right? Like this is why these technologies are important and, and what, you know, the impact that we think these are gonna continue to have um, in this area. Right, so these are kind of the two core technologies and I'm gonna kind of go deep dive on each of these a bit. You know, the first is really this, this AI driven sensing and communication. Um, and the second being kind of the AI native air interface. Um, and, and so with AI driven sensing, you know, the, the, the real goal is 
you know, real make sense out of the spectrum usage around you very quickly, um, allow all of that information to be used for machine optimization of continuous allocation and use of spectrum. Um, and then allow that information to also be used for numerous applications um, and, and other, other things that enables and unlocks. Uh, and then on the AI native air interface side, um, really allowing um, you know, AI and machine uh, continuous optimization to design and continually optimize the air interface um, to improve channel access, uh, wireless performance, and to help reduce both um, power and cost of these sorts of systems. So I think that there's been a, a fair amount of talk about this in the context of 6G. You know, I, I think, you know, AI native air interface is now something that has been widely discussed by a number of folks as a, a candidate technology within 6G. Um, but I think that we can't just think of this as some far out thing that's going to happen in 2030. Um, you know, this is actually very much an evolution of AI and machine learning into the RAN. Uh, and, and so I like to break it down into um, first the, the prototype systems that are outside of the standards environment. You know, we can build today um, AI native communication systems uh, based kind of just solely on technology uh, driven approach um, that, that are kind of outside the standard system and not yet within that kind of standards uh, process. Um, and these work for closed ecosystems. So things like SATCOM systems, IOT systems, kind of mesh and point to point systems. Um, these are all places where, you know, we are building today kind of AI native uh, radio systems uh, and, and continuing to mature and improve these. Um, but then also when we look at cellular systems, you know, I kind of bend this into three, three groups here. We have today's, you know, fully spec'd, um, you know, 4G and 5G uh, releases uh, that are out there, they're in deployment. All of the, you know, the specs are, are, are hardened um, and, um, you know, they're not going to change. Uh, and so here, you know, we really have to focus on transparent optimizations. So what improvements can we make in implementation and in the, the software and the signal processing that implements these systems? Uh, and here, there's actually a lot, of, a lot of room to improve the performance of these systems and the efficiency of these systems, um, you know, without any standard changes. These are all just in, you know, how does the, the base station operate? How does the L1 uh, signal processing operate? Um, and how can we better do resource allocation and improvement of these systems? And I think we're still seeing, you know, 5G systems today continuing to improve as, as all of those implementation aspects um, evolve. Um, you know, now we also have, you know, 3GPP RHEL um, 18, which is now 5G advanced, uh, which I think is, a, is, is kind of a stepping stone to fully AI native uh, systems. Um, and so here, you know, we're starting to look at discussion of AI and ML baseband processing techniques um, to help improve performance of a number of different aspects, uh, you know, that are going to be considered in the spec and may impact, you know, performance requirements. You know, the only way to get to certain performance levels may be to use some of these techniques. Um, and then, you know, but, but it's all still probably going to be within a fairly constrained um, physical layer and frame structure that's very similar to what we have with 5G today. Um, and then ultimately for 6G, you know, we see this could be, this could really evolve into, you know, true AIML native design of the actual framing, the, the waveform, the modulation scheme. Um, you know, we may not be OFDM at that point. Um, and here, you know, we could, you know, the, the table is still open to have you know, interoperability of, of machine learning functions throughout different components of the network with, with kind of standardized functions and interfaces. Uh, and the big thing here is this kind of idea of co-adaptation. So I think that it won't be until 6G that we see this, but this is when, you know, we allow like both ends of the link, you know, a, 
a base station and a UE to co-adapt their, their signal processing uh, jointly to work together. Uh, and that's something that, that requires, you know, deep uh, adoption in, in the standards uh, to, to really start to work. Um, so I think, you know, the point is that this 6G AI native interface is extremely exciting, um, but it's not just something out in the distance. Like this is an evolution of the technology to get there. Um, and we need to be doing this today and 4G, 5G systems, you know, maturing into more intricate systems in 5G advanced. And then ultimately these kind of end to end uh, AI native systems in 6G. Um, and yeah, and so this is just an example of one of our kind of non-standards based uh, AI native um, comm systems running uh, using this kind of channel autoencoder sort of idea. Um, so, um, right, so, that, so this is kind of going through, you know, those same three areas. So I think, you know, the biggest focus right now should be, you know, we have many, many, many 4G and 5G systems out in the world. Um, you know, we can save a lot of power uh, and um, a lot of operations time and a lot of hardware cost and, and footprint and impact um, by using kind of AI and ML transparently um, within today's space stations and, and within handsets. Um, and so our focus here really is within a lot of the L1 or the upper five processing tasks. So looking at kind of neural receivers uh, that can process a standard compliant waveform, but in doing so, they can improve the power consumption, they can improve throughput, uh, sensitivity and coverage, and they can help improve both the, the density, the resilience to interference or distortion, and the cost of these systems. So these are all, you know, things that we can really do today with these technologies. Um, and this is also an accelerator for, for open RAN and for kind of virtualized RANs that are broken up into components, um, because this can really help get the, the cost of these systems down. It can get the performance up and it can make them really very compelling um, options. Um, and so Omni 5 5G is kind of what we're, we've been building out in this space uh, to kind of plug into these open RANs and provide you know, better, more efficient software algorithms uh, on today's systems. Um, and then ultimately, you know, uh, the sensing side of this, providing you know, rapid visibility into what's going on in the air interface um, can provide a lot of help and automation in determining faults, diagnosing faults, um, finding security issues. Um, and helping with resource allocation, especially as we see more and more private uh, 5G networks deployed that don't have, you know, operators to, to, to run and, and, and use the, and spend time ensuring they're operating optimally. You know, so really this can, this can lead, to, lead to better rural coverage, better urban capacity, uh, and, and help decrease energy and costs. Um, you know, likewise, on the pre the pre 6G kind of um, AI native end to end systems that, that don't have standards compliance. Um, you know, we started out in this area uh, looking at, at satellite communications where your primary uh, constraint or data driven constraint is the, the nonlinearities. So um, amplifier uh, performance and, and behaviors um, that, that are. Um, sometimes hard to, to model in a closed form and, and that can be expensive if you just take kind of a, um, a traditional digital pre-distortion approach uh, to solving these. Uh, yeah, and then ultimately, I think that all of these technologies, you know, are, are really trying to mature to get to the point that, um, you, you know, we can start to really have candidate systems for, for 6G um, that, that leverage all of these techniques once they're, they've completely matured um, to get the best performance and the best density and energy efficiency we can out of the, these next generation systems. Um, so this is an example of, of kind of some of the work that, that, that we've been looking at um, within 4G and 5G systems today. So these are transparent optimizations 
Um, and, and so what we've been looking at here um, is, is taking, is looking both in the, the DU uh, and the CU and the RIC. Um, and so particularly in the DU, um, the upper L1 physical layer processing is a major power consumer. Um, and this is also a case where, um, you know, the data in a wireless system that you're leveraging is often, you know, the propagation data and the, the channel data um, and knowledge about interference between different users as you co-schedule them. Um, and so um, in this case, you know, we, we've really looked at, let's take a fully off the shelf commercial 5G standalone system uh, and, and put a neural receiver into it. Um, you know, we can allow AI machine learning to learn how to do this, this symbol recovery and detection um, and provide significant you know, improvements to, to the performance of the system while reducing latency and software um, complexity. So um, you know, this, is, this is also really exciting because we can now start to automate with these same AI techniques um, continuous monitoring of the RAN performance, so of the L1 performance, you know, how, how is it continuing to, to behave from bit error rates and SINAR perspectives um, and, and continually optimize the models that are used in the D1 um, and to help feed the, the resource allocation and the layer two functions um, for, for scheduling and, and allocation of many users. Um, and you know what's exciting is you know these this is, these are all software these are algorithmic upgrades and they're well aligned with you know the hardware and the compute platforms that are being used today um, and so these are really um, things that can be dropped into today's 4g and 5g systems and can really help improve performance today so this is kind of an example of a uh, a commercial ue connecting um, here out to the internet uh, on our SA system. Um, and you can see kind of the comparison of all the different um, receiver approaches. Um, and in this case, you know, you can get improved performance off of the, um, the neural receiver approach. So, um, you know, so this is an example then uh, of, of continuous monitoring of, of a, ML or a neural receiver enhanced uh, system. Um, and so, um, you know, here you're using the neural receiver for the push processing or the uplink in a 5G system to help improve uh, coverage uh, and performance. Um, you know, you can see that, you know, you could do this in simulation, but when you do this in simulation, the distributions of the channel models are still very whitened. They're still um, kind of somewhat contrived channel models that can be both easy and difficult in that um, you can often overfit to simulated models if they're, um, you know, too rigid in their uh, distribution. Um, but you can also make the problem more difficult if the distribution is less structured or, or less narrow in its distribution than a real world channel model. Um, and so uh, this lends to the importance of, of like tuning and optimizing in the real world. Um, and so, you know, this, this is then a trace of a neural receiver and an MMSE re receiver running. Uh, and you can see there's here's SINAR improvements. Um, but then once you do this continuous uh, tuning and online learning to continue to improve, the performance under the distribution of that sector's channel, uh, this can really, you can continue to drive up the SINAR and the margin that you have uh, to continue improving performance to some point. Um, so, you know, this is really exciting. You know, this is this has come from, you know, uh, research into really production. You know, we, we can put this into uh, commercial off the shelf DUs today. Um, and really help to improve their, their performance and, and their cost. Um, and so, you know, ultimately this is gonna help us extend cell range, uh, cope with some of the nasty situations like cell edge and interference cases and provide better wireless access 
um, for, for lower costs to, to more people. Um, and, you know, these many of the problems that you're dealing with in a neural receiver are to do with the channel distribution um, and what, how much this varies in the real world, how do we, how we train models and make them generalize for all of the users in a sector. Um, and so these are all problems that we can solve and mature now uh, that are ultimately, you know, critical for us to be able to, to, to solve this 6G end-to-end uh, AI native air interface problem. Uh, so this is then, as we start to look at, um, you know, beyond standards, so beyond the, the 4G, 5G air interface we use today, uh, you know, kind of this full AI native waveform um, that, that can learn new uh, frame structure, it can learn new um, modulation techniques, so you're not constrained by, by all the structure in the spec today. Um, and so, you know, this is an example uh, that we've been working on that's looking at, you know, you know, can we extend this to, to multi-carrier and multi-objective learning um, as a candidate uh, waveform for, for these sorts of um, beyond 5G systems or for, you know, non-standards usage. Uh, and so I think, you know, it's really exciting to see that this whole idea of kind of the channel autoencoder uh, based uh, AI native waveforms uh, that, that use neural networks to both encode and to receive the data um, are maturing in, in many, many ways, you know, not just with what we're doing, but with a lot of work and literature that's going on um, out in, in kind of the research industry as well. Um, and so, you know, this was really looking at, you know, can we design waveforms for, for resiliency and high reliability? Um, can we kind of tailor them for, for specific access strategies? Um, and can we, can we shape them for certain um, spectral masks and certain deployment scenarios and conditions where we're kind of really doing this optimization for several different objectives? Um, so what you see on the right here, you know, this is a... Um, kind of a, a multi-carrier grid. So we're looking at a big chunk of time frequency. You know, we've shaped this to a, a very specific kind of spectral mask so that, you know, if you have to fit into some shared spectrum system and comply with, you know, very arbitrary sorts of spectrum masks, you can do that. Um, but you also, of course, want to minimize BRRRR, um, maximize your throughput and your spectral efficiency. Um, under things like fading. So here you're actually optimizing this waveform end to end through you know, a, a um, frequency selective TDL fading model, um, but you're also doing it with, with interference. So um, you might have PIM or industrial noise or jamming uh, unintentionally in a lot of different environments. So here you can kind of learn this big multi-carrier waveform um, to, to work optimally over this fading channel that has, you know, this harsh jamming impairment running through it uh, that may move around and, and may be present in different situations. Um, and so, you know, this is a way that we can really start to do waveform design for, for all sorts of, you know, interesting deployment scenarios um, to make, make our waveforms and our interfaces more resilient in the future. Um, so, Kind of switching modes over to the sensing side, um, you know, we AI at the edge is a huge thing now, and, and and you know we have in many of our phones now, you know, specific neural network accelerators for edge AI applications, um, and and certainly for vision and speech and NLP, this is like widely in deployment now. This is already adopted. This is widely used, um, but. You know, these approaches work extremely well on RF and air interface data as well to make sense out of it very quickly. <laughs> um, and so, you know, this is also a very computationally efficient way um, of understanding what's going on in the spectrum with, with kind of extreme accuracy and speed. Um, and I think that what's really exciting about this is that this is an enabler for um, communications and sensing in the future. So. You know, if we want to maximize the performance of our communication systems, we really need to know, you know, what's going on in the spectrum, like um, what other emitters are out there, what other interferers are out there, um, how are the signals that we're transmitting propagating 
and interfering with one another between many different users in a sector or a scenario. Um, and so, you know, sensing, I think, has been difficult to integrate into cellular comms in the past due to kind of prohibitive costs, um, you know, insufficient performance um, and, and insufficient compute and power. But I think what we're seeing now is that, you know, we, we can really drive down the costs, the power, we can make these things really fast and accurate. Uh, and so this is like an amazing data source now to help feedback and drive and improve communication system performance. Um, so these are just some examples of, of doing this on kind of small embedded sensing platforms uh, and then pushing the analytics from this data into kind of analytics platforms and anomaly detection platforms. Um, and again, I just wanted to show, you know, like this technology has been climbing a, a long, slow curve. So I think if you look back at computer vision, um, you know, in, in, in 2012, and you look at how well could you recognize objects, how well could you detect objects in an environment, um, you know, it was, it was painful, right? It, it, we've, we've grown incredibly um, in the past 10 years towards how well we can do object recognition and vision um, and how well we can rapidly understand uh, the things around us to the point that, you know, companies like Tesla can now have the confidence in these object detection models to actually drive cars around autonomously. You know, we have enough trust in the accuracy that we can actually really, really rely, start to rely on these systems for accurate data. Um, and so, you know, this is exciting because, you know, we can now have, you know, realistically have real-time awareness of, you know, of all the activity uh, going on in the spectrum. Um, we can use this now to go help inform our propagation models, our, our spectrum allocation models, and to help continue driving up our spectral efficiency and our reuse and our, our sum rate for all of the users that we need to serve. Um, so, yeah, so this is really, you know, this is the raw information about how the spectrum is being used. That's the feedback to, the, to all of our comm systems. Um, that we need to be able to tackle. Um, and then, so this is, so this is, <clears throat> so this is just a couple different examples um, of using this class of AIML based wideband signal, signal recognition in some very difficult environments. So here we're looking at these kind of fleeting IoT devices and autonomous systems where we can recognize if they're coming in and out of an environment or near devices or what, bands and spectrum they're using. Um, we can pull out things like in-band interference. So these are actually interfering signals sitting behind um, cellular uh, signals. And so this is this is a case where you know this would be a very hard um, rec condition to recognize, you know, interferes and, and jamming that's going on and just degrading your cellular performance. Um, but this could take you know, a lot of time for someone to try to manually diagnose and figure out. And we can do this now in like milliseconds uh, so that things can react and resolve these issues. Uh, and then in ultra dense RF environments. So, you know, there's many places where we may see, you know, hundreds or thousands of different RF signals and emitters um, where these sorts of, of patterns can, or these sorts of recognition systems can kind of pull out kind of the needles in the haystack. You know, these can, these can find like, if there are very unique uh, sorts of autonomous systems or interferers or, or, or activities going on in the network that you really you know, need to alert on and fix and resolve, um, you know, this is just getting more and more capable. And it's really exciting to watch kind of as we're slowly climbing the, the, the curve of getting better and better and better uh, at doing AI and ML-based spectrum sensing and, and, and sense making. Um, so, you know, why, why is this useful? Well, so, you know, this is kind of the fuel for having this digital representation of the spectrum world around us and like what is going on um, and, and, and how do we leverage it? How do we use this to make our comm systems better? Um, and so, you know, these are some examples, um, you know, not only can you recognize all of the 
you know, spectral events and bursts and, and emitters in an environment, uh, but you can start to localize them. Um, so, you know, this is kind of showing at the bottom, um, you know, we're localizing every kind of burst of energy that's going on in the spectrum uh, and figuring out where it is um, with kind of ML based uh, localization approaches that, that actually outperform a lot of the more traditional uh, tools that have, that have been used for that sort of application um, on a very, very short time basis. Um, so this gives us kind of a spatial degree of where are all these emitters and how do they fit into our, our physical world. Um, and then, you know, our propagation models today are, are, are very, very simple. If we look at things like CBRS in the US and, and kind of spectrum sharing uh, efforts around the world, um, many of them are using kind of very primitive, um, you know, height above average terrain or, or, or path loss models um, to try to make sure we don't interfere with each other. Um, but if you look at kind of today, you know, we have these very dense urban environments um, where we don't want, uh, you know, you know we, we don't want to make some assumption like there's free space path loss or that height above average terrain is the only effect going on that's going to limit our interference. Um, in many cases, there's buildings and barriers um, and reflectors. And so um, there's actually often much more dense packing uh, that we can do of spatial reuse of spectrum. Um, and so, you know, as we have this spatial information about emitters and propagation and power levels of emissions on many, many different devices, um, we, can, we can start to build these more and more powerful AI-driven propagation and channel models uh, that, that tell us, you know, what does the propagation actually look like in this sector, in this environment, in this building, uh, and we can kind of automatically learn and tune these um, to, to, to learn much more better and accurate models uh, than we could do with kind of more simplistic closed form uh, model driven approaches. Um, and so ultimately, you know, we're, we're able to feed all of this raw sensing information um, into make this kind of better uh, representation of the world around us and how the spectrum propagates through it. And this all can go back into the comm system to help us do better um, scheduling, better, uh, better beam forming, you know, better spatial reuse uh, of the world around us um, so that we can get more more capacity, um, better performance, more reliable performance um, to all the users in these wireless systems. Um, so on top of that, I mean, the, the, the analytics that we can do here are actually very rich. So if you look at things like, um, you know, cellular traffic in an office environment, you can start to see, you know, pattern of life. Uh, you can start to understand physical phenomena about uh, people and events and behaviors that are going on uh, just based on um, RF traffic and emissions. So there's this kind of rich real world uh, anomalies that are going on that you can observe from this kind of spectral view of the world. Um, and then you can also do the, the kind of rapid anomaly and change detection uh, in the RF environment as well. So um, if there's introductions of new radios or bands or jammers or, or uh, um, unmanned systems in an environment, you can you can rapidly pick this out. Um, and so this is just an example here where, you know, we're, we're looking at a standard pattern of life over a, a spectrum environment. And immediately there's there's a new a new emitter introduced into the environment. Um, and within, you know, a second or less than a second, we can start to have very, very high confidence. This is F1 scores over over 90 um, that that are, you know, that this is anomalous, this is something new happening. Um, and so we can really start to build logic and understanding around these sorts of change detection uh, and, and spectral changes. Um, so um, yeah, so, so kind of stepping back a little bit into the, the research uh, realm of this, you know, why are these impactful? Um, well, we've had a lot of different types of RF sensing in the past, we've had things like energy detectors, which are very blind to the features. They're really just looking at a simple feature called, you know, energy um, to try to do detection of different emitters. Um, we've had very specialized detectors like matched filters, 
um, which can go and, and correlate a very specific sequence and they can have very good sensitivity in doing that. Um, and we've had this kind of this whole trade space between very general and very specialized detectors. Um, but we have this trade off between complexity and generalization of the, these approaches versus kind of the accuracy and sensitivity that they provide. Um, and so ML, these ML based sensing techniques are just really exciting now because they can do both, right? You can get very um, high generality and low complexity and implementation time and compute complexity um, with very high accuracy. And so this, this really makes sensing now um, an important port, part of, of how we build and optimize and run our, our comm systems. Um, and then meanwhile, you know, it, it's important to note that, you know, ML-based methods are not a fixed target. So, you know, if you look at computer vision uh, and kind of similar large convolutional neural networks for doing these sorts of tasks in vision, you know, we started out with these very simple architectures like VGG, um, which were very high computational complexity. Um, and then there's kind of this curve between complexity and accuracy. Um, but that curve is constantly moving. So, you know, this is this this plot is a couple years old. We've seen this kind of curve move left and up so that we get more and more accurate and lower and lower complexity models. Uh, and now we're, you know, we're even lower. So, so we can get very, very accurate models that are very low complexity. Um, and, and this is really exciting because a lot of the fundamental, you know, progress that's been made in machine learning and computer vision, um, we can leverage for similar models in the wireless spectrum. So we can actually do this continually for less power uh, and more accurately. So this is really a, a long-term trend, which is just continuing to happen um, as R&D continues in this area. So, you know, it, in this area, there's been this, this kind of long running toy problem now of modulation recognition, you know, looking at, um, you know, I, I'm looking at one signal, what kind of signal is it? Is it QPSK or FSK or 16 QAM? You know, this is just kind of an end class decision, um, just, to, just a classifier. Uh, and this was a really exciting early result because it showed like we can get significant sensitivity here over traditional approaches, um, you know, leveraging just a data driven approach. Um, but the problem is that, you know, this is really a very simplistic toy problem. And we need to start scaling research to the bigger problem uh, of, you know, this is actually a very complex spectrum environment. I'm not just staring at this one signal and trying to figure out what it is. Um, I need to actually figure out all the things that are going on. Um, and so, you know, the real problem here now is, is okay, I need to detect, um, kind of localize and classify all of these emitters and activities that are going on in the spectrum. Um, and so to do this, you know, we can start to look at, um, at precision recall curves. We can start to adopt um, some other metrics that are, that are used more widely. Um, and so now, you know, this is really a, a much more general problem. So, you know, what's going on in my band? Who am I sharing spectrum with? You know, what are the interferers? Um, you really need to be able to quickly process and make sense out of these wide bands of activity, not just, you know, one classification problem. Um, so to help really try to encourage or, you know, provide a data set for research in this direction, um, you know, we put together this, this data set and this challenge um, originally for this IEEE SPOC conference. Um, and you know, we'd really like to see more people tackling this, this problem of broad spectrum sensing rather than just kind of the toy of, of modulation recognition. Um, and so, you know, this, this link here goes to the challenge page. Um, we've got kind of a big open data set now of what are all these um, uh, different band plans and layouts and, and how can you go and identify all the different activities that are going on in them. Um, and so you're trying to figure out, you know, what signals are present, what kind of bandwidths and, and, and center frequencies are they on, what um, classes are they, what types of signals. Um, and we're trying to move now, you know, accuracy was a very simple metric. 
Um, you know, there, there's better metrics now looking at precision and recall uh, and looking at F1 score and then adopting this idea of intersection over union or, you know, how well did you estimate where the signal was. Um, so I think this is kind of an exciting challenge and an evolution in RF sensing of, um, you know, looking beyond just, just classifiers um, into this recognition problem. So we're, we're really hoping that, that other folks and researchers might start looking more at, at data sets and problems like this. And I think right now we're kind of continuing this competition indefinitely um, until we get more and more participation and interest. Um, and so I'll conclude there. Those are kind of the, I think covered all the areas I was hoping to. And um, you know, we'd love to, to take some questions and, and Thank thoughts. you so much, Tim, uh, for the nice explanation and just going through everything. So I'd like to invite uh, Vishnu. Uh, good evening. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Thomas. And Over to uh, you. Great talk. Yeah, thank you. Uh, great talk. Uh, thanks, Tim. There is a let me let me uh, you know. Last year we talked, uh, and uh, it was a. It, it is a great continuation now we are seeing. You have uh, the data set as well as uh, some of the problems that you described are, I would say, matured over a period of time. And you, you, your challenge, uh, the competition that you're running, probably, probably uh, we should join hands as well. There is a question here, which is uh, interesting. NVIDIA Omniverse, uh, now I don't know about it. But the question is, are you using NVIDIA Omniverse for developing R of world models? I think this is related to one of your slides where you were showing the uh, R of layers on top of the models. Uh, that, that may be the question. Would you like to take that? Sure, yeah. I mean, we have um, definitely been looking at and playing with Omniverse. I think we're, um, you know, we're looking at a, a couple platforms, but um, Omniverse is definitely a very interesting one. Um, so we're, uh, I think the, the fundamental data sources and models can plug into several different kind of digital world representations. And, and Omniverse is a very cool one as well that, that, um, that, you know, we've done a little bit of, but we'll be sharing. Thank you. Uh, Arthur has a bunch of, ah, there is a pointer from Arthur. <laughs> thanks, thanks, thank you, Arthur. There is a question on object detection metric, which I don't know if it is relevant, but I want to ask you again, are you using Yakard index? Could you please take that one? Yeah, so we've been using intersection over union, which is kind of a generalization of the Jacquard index. So they're very, very similar um, in terms of uh, of what do you count as a detection and how do you score a detection? Um, you know, the, um, you know the, the, the idea behind your card index is very, very similar to the intersection over union, union um, concept. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There is a question from Mani in the chat window. Please explain how ML-based uh, ML sensing methods, I think he means sensing methods, could be lower complexity that's than cyclostationary or mass filtering. Are you considering only post-trained uh, ML detection case? That's in the chat window, please. So if you look at a lot of those methods, match filtering and cyclostationarity, um, you know, sometimes they can be computationally efficient. Sometimes they need to integrate for long periods of time. Um, and then there's also aspects such as how stable are they to things like frequency selective fading or frequency stability. Um, and so, um, and then there's the problem of generality, right? So cyclostationarity and match filtering, you often need to look at very specific cycle distances or specific match filter taps or patterns to do that recognition. So it's all a big trade space. There are, are certainly cases where if you're looking for one cycle frequency in a signal, um, you may be able to design an efficient cyclostationary detector, or you're looking for one you know, pattern um, that you wanna do a match filter for, uh, and all of your channel statistics are stable enough 
for that to work and not to need to do a full calf search, um, you know, then those are, those are also viable. Um, but, you know, the comparisons that we've done on kind of the data sets that we've looked at, you know, we are getting significantly reduced complexity and improved accuracy, you know, using these sorts of, of ML based detection approaches. Um, but again, I mean, there's many ways to use uh, use some of these techniques. So it's hard to, it's hard to speak completely in generalities. Thank you, Tim. And uh, thanks, Marnie, for that question. Uh, let me take one more. Ethan is asking, do you keep training, updating neural network or these receiver structures? Does it affect the complexity? I guess the question is about retraining and updating of uh, your models. Yeah, so ultimately that comes down to how stable is your channel or the or the the channel distribution in a sector. Um, and so, you know, the way we've looked at it is that, you know, it's dialable. How much time do you spend doing inference and forward processing of data? How much time do you spend doing training uh, and updating of the model based on new data? So if the, the sector is completely stable, you don't need to spend a lot of time retraining. Um, the other consideration is that, you know, forwards inference in a neural receiver has to be very fast and low latency. You know, this needs to be sub millisecond um, to be useful and, and often much lower than that. Um, whereas training can be a much slower process that you can offload somewhere else. You know, it doesn't need to happen sub millisecond. Um, and so there's a lot you can do to balance and schedule the two compute tasks. Um, in that process. So, so in this case, I mean, um, we, you know, in any case where that is a complexity issue, you can generally offload it. Um, but you can also, you know, really when you're starting with a model and you're just doing fine tuning for um, a sector, um, the, the compute load is generally not that high. You know, this can be done very, very manageably without being a major compute burden. You know, a lot of the models we're using are very small. Um, they don't need to be nearly as large as some of these, you know, multi-hundred network computer vision models that are used. Um, and so they can actually train very, very quickly at low complexity in many cases. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tim. Uh, there is a question from Uday. He's asking effect of noise on detection. Mm -hmm. uh, how can we tackle that issue? Yeah, so I think, you know, if you look at every symbol detection and, and receiver approach, you know, there's some trade-off and performance curve with regard to the noise level or the signal to noise and interference level. Um, and so, you know, it's critical as you design these to look at the behavior over that noise range. Um, and so, you know, certainly that's a big piece of the analysis and the performance that, that you have to look at to make sure that, you know, you can, the models and the, the DNNs or the CNNs that you're using to do this neural receiver generalize well to different noise levels and to different fading profiles. Um, you know, that's a big piece of, of taking this whole approach and bringing it to production is, is making sure that, you know, it can generalize robustly you know, across all those sorts of conditions that they'll see in the real world. So noise is definitely a, a big piece of that. Okay, thank you. The Another question for Arthur, what type of uh, features, uh, IQ or IQ plus other features? Uh, I guess he's uh, clarifying later that uh, this his question is about modulation classification. Yeah, so, um, a lot of what we're doing is operating on the raw IQ. I mean, I think we've tried to come at baseband processing from the extreme side of like, how much can we learn directly from the data without using model-driven feature design? And then going back and looking at, okay, if I introduce certain features and certain pre-processing stages, um, you know, can this help improve performance? Can this help reduce complexity? Um, and so, you know, in much of the sensing work we showed here, it is using raw sample data kind of into the network. It's not doing 
for instance, uh, cumulants as a pre-processing stage. Um, but there definitely has been a fair amount of work um, out there in literature around you know, doing more traditional feature extraction, like a number of higher order moments or higher order cumulants, and then putting those kind of compact features into another um, method, whether it's a decision tree or gradient boosted tree or a neural network to try to make a decision. Um, in fact, I think that the XGBoost baseline that we showed on one of the slides there, you know, we're doing exactly that. So, so that's very viable. Um, but we've seen that that's really not always necessary, um, you know, and, and not something that we do typically. Okay, thank you. There is uh, one more question on uh, traditional approaches versus machine learning mechanisms. I guess this question, um, I would want to link it with your uh, your viewpoints, Tim, uh, with where you were talking about certain specific scenarios, especially uh, you know the, what what you described in your slides. But I guess the question Guillaume is asking uh, uh, to compare machine learning mechanisms uh, against traditional mechanisms, especially for uh, channel estimation, you know, modulation classification, this kind of problems, there are already, already mechanisms. So that's what uh, the question is, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that is, you know, the exact comparison we need to be continuing to do. So when we look at all of the different functional blocks that happen in a radio, um, which ones will continue to perform very well, which ones won't. And then I think the biggest question that I try to continually ask is, you know, what were the assumptions of every one of those blocks and how well does it generalize in the real world? You know, if we design a um, error correction decoder to assume a binary symmetric channel, um, but then we have frequency selective fading, um, or, or we have something that, that kind of breaks the initial assumptions. Um, you know, the problem is, you know, how well does it does, you know, the traditional method generalize in the real world. Um, so, you know, I tend to think the most immediate things uh, or, or one of the places where we have the most model deficiency in the real world is in the channel and in the channel modeling and the propagation modeling and in the hardware effects of many of these systems. Uh, and then, so that's where, you know, channel estimation, equalization, combining and demodulation are kind of a very nice place where um, using data instead of just kind of a compact model assumption about how the world works uh, has a major opportunity for improvement. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of places within the chain where we've seen things like um, using um, neural networks that have a lot of model um, inspired structure, like, uh, you know, unrolling uh, belief propagation graphs in a neural network, you know, have significant potential for um, improving performance and, and reducing complexity and things like error correction as well. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of places in the stack, but you really have to, for every single one of these, um, look at the assumptions, uh, how well the assumptions we've made match the real world, you know, how the performance in both complexity and, you know, accuracy and capacity change. Um, so I know that's kind of a general answer. Um, I mean, I, I tend to think that a lot of the different components of the signal processing change are ripe to be um, improved uh, by using learning and data-driven approaches. And, and this is even more exciting if we can do end-to-end -end learning of kind of multiple components uh, separately rather than just specific components of the signal processing chain, just so that we can come up with joint solutions uh, under real-world assumptions for the whole comms chain. Um, so I think that's, that's really ultimately why uh, the AI native uh, phi uh, is so exciting is that we can, we can really try to learn this, this whole joint solution to realistic assumptions and let it be driven by data for this continual improvement. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. There is a question on mobile net like the topologies. 
for edge deployment? Are you looking at mobile net like topologies? Yeah, so I think um, anyone in ML research field right now has the problem of a, a fire hose of incredible research being done by you know, millions of people around the world. Um, and so keeping up with, with the best new architectures and efficiencies is, is always a major challenge. I think MobileNet uh, it was a very interesting work. And, and I think you know, some of the, the architectural advances that they, that they used in MobileNet to drive down you know, computational complexity and, and to make uh, these, these networks fit nicely on edge devices um, you know, were, were a great step forward. Um, but they're one of many. So I think like, um, you know, we are constantly trying to digest, you know, all of the advances that we can keep up with uh, in published literature and across ML and then try to leverage, you know, those aspects that work really well into architectures that are designed for comms tasks. Um, and I think that, you know, that's a huge balance right now between, you know, how much do you focus on and one problem in one area and then how do you how do you survey and understand the advances across you know vision and speech and voice and, and how like those different architecture and, and compute reduction advances can be used and leveraged in in comms sorts of, of learning tasks Thank you. There is a question on security and adversarial attacks. Uh, to what extent are DNN's adversarial attacks an issue? And, and how can you protect uh, this question? Yeah, so it's, it's an um, interesting question. I mean, adversarial um, attacks on machine learning are, are kind of an exciting area. I think that you have to think a lot about again, about assumptions um, and the impact of attacks. I think there are some areas, like certainly in natural language um, and in vision, where we've seen things like deep fakes or generative text models that look like natural language, um, where, where these are really pretty serious concerns on their impact and, and the dangers of them. I think in common systems, um, we're a little bit less, um, you know, it's a little bit less critical in many of the adversarial attacks. I think that um, often the assumptions for adversarial attacks are, are somewhat different. You know, you can't craft an exact input to um, a receiver um, because it has to go through a channel. Um, so there's, there's all of the kind of channel effects that are going on. Uh, in the real world, uh, you can't actually, you know, flip one bit that's going to disrupt a model because, you know, it's going through all these perturbation effects of noise and fading anyway. Um, and so part of making a model generalize and, and be robust to lots of different channels uh, is coping with, you know, making it robust to, um, to adversarial or, 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 or different, different modes that could arrive. So I think part of it is through, you know, augmentation, making sure that, you know, you're robust against all the expected effects. Um, and then the other half is, you know, every adversarial attack can be turned around into kind of an adversarial defense. Um, and so, um, you know, for instance, in sensing, um, you, you can look at, you know, what adversarial attacks could be used, and then you can often, you know, employ those uh, sometimes in a in kind of a adversarial way within your own training and hardening process uh, to harden them against those sorts of adversarial attacks. Um, so I think that you know we're going to be seeing you know the same way we do in the, the computer security world, uh, where there is constantly new sorts of attacks or, or vec attack vectors and then defensive mechanisms to um, try to prevent them. You know I think we're going to be constantly seeing that same sort of um, iteration in all of our AI and ML models in, in many, many different applications for many, many years. Um, but I think it's also important to keep in context that, you know, we can adapt now, whereas, you know, crafting attacks against, 
um, traditional non-adaptive comm systems is almost trivially easy. Um, there's, there's things that you can do there uh, that will immediately disrupt or, or, or cause problems in these systems um, that they have no ability to adapt to. So I think that you know, even if you know nothing is is perfect, even if there there are some attacks and there will be an evolution over time of attacks and defenses, um, we're still worlds ahead of you know where we were with you know fixed features and fixed um, kind of hard hard coded methods that could be abused in other other sorts of ways. Thank you. Uh, maybe one last uh, question from Arthur: uh, Would likelihood-based classifiers be superior? For, for certain type of uh, signals? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, what we've really been focused on with ML is have something that's very accurate and very general. So it doesn't claim to be the most accurate in every single case. You know, for instance, if you have a match filter or you have some feature or likelihood based uh, thing that, that is extremely specially purpose designed for one class of signal uh, and you've spent you know years engineering and architecting that detector um, then you know absolutely um, you could find a more sensitive detector without machine learning in many cases um, so I think that you have to look at it in terms of you know generalization as well so how quickly can we recognize all the types of emitters that are going to be out there, you know, how can we cope with, you know, all of the sorts of impa channel impairments and conditions that'll be out there. And then how quickly can we, we pull in new signatures or new emitters or new types of interference uh, to retrain and, and deploy these models again uh, with improvements. Um, so, I mean, again, it's, it's hard to make totally general statements. I mean, there, there's, there's absolutely cases where, you know, certain feature based uh, classifiers will, will continue to work better. Um, but I think they really, their big problem is in generalization and, and, and sometimes in computational complexity. Uh -huh. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Tim. Uh, I could not get to my list of questions, but that's fine. I mean, uh, I can catch you again uh, next time. So thank, thank you so much for patiently answering all the questions. It was a wonderful talk, a very exciting field, uh, plus the data. I, I don't need to mention the data. So yeah, I think it's a very exciting field. Thank you so much for staying back. We, we are 10 minutes over. Thank you so much for patiently answering all the questions. Awesome. Well, thank you both for hosting me and for all the, the great questions from, from the audience.